This is 5 on 20 News. I'm Mike Ludwig. And I'm Luke Goodhart. It's Wednesday, May 17th, and we're coming to you live from the Creative Tucson Studios in downtown Tucson. First, let's talk local headlines. Mike? Three Republican senators, including Arizona's Jeff Flake, are calling on the United Nations Security Council to take immediate actions against North Korea. The senators wrote, a letter to the council saying that, quote, we urge the UN Security Council to take immediate and additional actions to increase pressure on the DPRK and bring Pyongyang into full compliance with its international obligations. Along with Flake, Senators Marco Rubio of Florida and Cory Gardner of Colorado signed on to the letter. In the letter, the senators called for increased sanctions that block North Korea's access to hard currency and actions on the country's cyber warfare program. A hacker working for Google found on Monday that code used for the massive WannaCry ransomware attack was similar to a past attack by North Korea. U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley also warned that the U.S. could inflict broader sanctions on countries who aid North Korea. The Security Council held an emergency meeting yesterday because of the latest missile launched by North Korea. Experts say that the test represents a significant step in the country's quest for an intercontinental ballistic missile that could someday reach the United States. The missile said on Sunday, or the, the missile test on Sunday reached a height of over 1,300 miles, then came back down into the atmosphere. At maximum trajectory, the missile could have traveled 2,800 miles, far enough to reach the U.S.-owned island of Guam. If the threat of sanctions fail, U.S. officials are calling on a group of really strong dudes to push the island of Guam a few miles further into the ocean to avoid uh, attack. Let's hope those 20,000 strong men can keep it together. Yeah, totally. The federal government claims that an Arizona farm kept its Mexican workers in squalid conditions and didn't pay them what they were owed for labor. The Department of Labor last week filed a lawsuit against G Farms in El Mirage, located northwest of Phoenix. The department says that the farm kept about 70 workers housed in dangerous and unsanitary conditions. The housing was made up of school buses, semi-trailers, a cargo container, and an open-air shed. G Farm's attorney says that the allegations are inaccurate and the farm had already placed workers in hotels and apartments. But according to court documents, the farm crammed 10 workers into each school bus where they slept. The rear entrances of the buses were blocked by air conditioners, which the Labor Department says created a safety risk. And the documents state that the air conditioners only blew hot air. The department also found that the shower facilities were filthy and full of trash, and an electrical cord was being used for lighting running from the shower area and exposed to standing water. The workers came from Sinaloa, Mexico in late April to harvest onions. They were paid between 13 and 17 cents for a bag of onions, which the department says is well below the $10.95 an hour they should have been paid. G Farm says it intends to pay the workers as soon as they pay the electric bill for all that hot air they've been using in their school buses. According to a recent study, Arizona is the eighth highest state in the country. A study by WalletHub says that the state ranks eighth in its rate of drug use, outranking states like New York, California, and Texas. Arizona also placed in the top 10 for the percent of adults who needed but didn't get drug treatment in the past year, and the percent of teens who used illegal drugs in the past year. The state also ranked third when it came to the percentage of teens offered illegal drugs, but only 13th for the percentage of adults who used drugs in the past month. So let's try harder next year, adults. The only area where Arizona ranked lower than most other states was in the number of opioid prescriptions per capita, where the state was 26th. But we made up for it by finishing number one in meth-induced hallucinations in front of Circle K. Probably that one at Speedway in sixth. Proposition 101 passed easily yesterday in a special election for Tucson. The law adds a half-cent sales tax and will raise around $250 million in revenue over the next five years. The sales tax increase starts July 1st and will last until 2022. From the revenue raised, $100 million will be used to repair, restore, and resurface city streets, and $150 million will go to the Tucson Police and Fire Departments for vehicle care and replacement. The measure will cost Tucson residents around $3 per month, about the cost of a bicycle tube after the wheel is consumed in a famous Tucson road crater. We might be eighth on the list for drug use, but it looks like the kids are all right. 
An Arizona youth survey found that opioid use has decreased among high school seniors in the state. Last year, the survey found that nearly 14% of high school seniors tried opioids in their lifetime, which was down from 27% in 2010. Nationwide, about 8% of high school seniors say they have used opioids, compared to 13% in 2010. Shamari Jackson, a prevention specialist with drug-free AZ Kids, said that while the results are encouraging, it's still too high of a percentage and her organization is looking to lower it even more. She said that educating parents is one of the best ways to prevent teen opioid use, along with encouraging parents to get rid of any prescription drugs that they don't need. Jackson said that police and fire departments accept leftover prescription drugs, which they promoted on National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. During that event, they received more than 9,500 pounds of prescription drugs. Governor Doug Ducey has also shown a desire to intervene in high schools. Ducey's office announced that $3.5 million would be allocated for substance abuse programs in Arizona high schools. Ducey then immediately popped a fuel valium to calm his nerves for doing something mildly progressive. Got to do something with that 9,500 pounds of seized drugs, I guess. Last Friday, University of Arizona officials said that they may eliminate the title of social justice advocates on campus. However, they're not getting rid of the position, but rather just its name. The duties of a social justice advocate included reporting on any, quote, bias incidents committed by students living in the dorms. But the position and its duties were being distorted by the right-wing press, according to school officials. This included Tom Knighton of PJ Media, who claimed that the job encouraged students to snitch on their peers. Knighton said that it would take taxpayer money and create a, quote, social justice Gestapo. Other commentators said that the role would only increase the overbearing political correctness that is infecting college campuses in the U.S. And it appears that college students are also fighting back against what they perceive as the policing of political speech. Nick Sweeten, executive director of U of A Residence Life, says that for the first time in his 24-year career, he is hearing students complain that they don't feel their views are welcome. Sweeten said that, quote, we need to do something about this. However, Sweeten says it's inaccurate that the social justice advocates are encouraged to spy on others. Rather, he says the position encourages students to expose them to an idea. Then when those ideas are challenged, changing the name of the idea to something else and getting people to shut up about it. And I want to take a moment to talk about the program you're watching right now. Here at 5 on 20, we are undertaking a new kind of citizen journalism. We're going to give you the news as we see it, and we want more people to speak up with us. We need writers, hosts, anchors, camera people, sound people, the whole hammock. The times require a new way of informing ourselves, so join us. Do it. Do it now. Email us at info at creativetucson.org to get involved. And if you think there's a story we're missing, a person we should interview, an upcoming event we should cover, or have any news tips for us, shoot an email to info at creativetucson.org. We are here for you, and we want to cover all the stories from all points of views. So don't be strangers. And now in national and international news. Come on, Tucson, get in that hammock with us. While our economy stagnates, the stock market has boomed, and Congress has taken advantage. Unsurprisingly, according to a Politico report, numerous members of Congress have traded stocks worth millions of dollars, with many of these stocks concerning areas of legislation that they govern. Tom Price, Donald Trump's pick for head of Health and Human Services, came under fire months ago for investing in healthcare companies that he had a hand in helping. The stocks were from a tiny Australian biotech company called Innate Immunotherapeutics. Even though the company has no approved drugs on the market and little name recognition in the U.S., their stocks surged soon after Price bought shares. This was soon after Price engineered legislation that would help the company by speeding up patent approvals. But the trail didn't end at Price. According to the report, Republican Representative Chris Collins had given Price the stock tip and invested in the company himself. A day after Senator Ron Wyden criticized the stock trades, Republican representatives Doug Lamburn, Billy Long, Mike Conaway, and John Culberson also bought stock in the company. The issue is raising concerns about the use of stock trades among congressmen, which look an awful lot like conflicts of interest. The report found that 28 House members and six senators each traded over 100 stocks in the past two years. A handful of these lawmakers engaged in trades for companies that have an interest in their work on Capitol Hill. These include Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who invested in health care stocks 10 days before the House was to vote on the 21st Century Cures Act, which helped spur medical research. 
The stocks included pharmaceutical firms McKesson, Gilead, and Abbott Labs. White House bought additional stock in Gilead and Amgen only two days before the legislation was to be approved. So it appears that insider trading is one of the only things that Democrats and Republicans can agree on. The list also included Republican Representative Adam Kinzinger, who first helped raise funding for the technological firm Precient Edge. He then became a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, which oversees issues affecting tech companies such as Precient Edge. And let's not forget Republican Representative Chuck Fleischman of Tennessee, who bought stocks in two medical companies, Juno Therapeutics and Celgene, a week before the Obama administration announced new measures to speed up approval for cancer therapies. Fleischman proves that Congress can even make curing cancer sleazy. In more news about the Health and Human Services Secretary, addiction experts are criticizing comments by Tom Price for what they say are unscientific and damaging to the fight against opioid abuse. Nearly 700 experts wrote a letter to the agency for the comments by Price where he said that medication-assisted treatment for opioid addiction is, quote, substituting one opioid for another. Price was referring to methadone and suboxone, both drugs provided to ease the withdrawal of effects of opioid addiction. The letter notes that there is a, quote, substantial body of research showing that these drugs are effective in fighting addiction and have been the standard treatment for years. Brendan Solinar, an addiction researcher at Johns Hopkins University, says that Price's own agency provides information that contradicts Price's statements on its website. On the HHS website, it states that, quote, a common misconception associated with medication-assisted treatment is that it substitutes one drug for another. Price blamed the mistake on the fact that he doesn't know what misconception means. Price then asked a crowd of reporters what misconception means. Huh. Yellowstone National Park rangers report that a rare white wolf was shot in the park last month. The wolf was found by hikers suffering from severe wounds. Later, the wolf was euthanized by park staff. Yellowstone officials now say that the wolf suffered from a gunshot wound based on the preliminary results from a necrop necrop necropsy by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. That's a hell of a word. Yeah. They say that the animal was shot sometime between April 10th or April 11th on the north side of the park near Gardner, Montana. A reward of up to $5,000 was offered for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of the individuals responsible. A local advocacy group called Wolves of the Rockies soon doubled the reward after donations poured in. The wolf was only one of three white wolves found in the park and was 12 years old, twice the age of the average wolf in the park. Gun rights activists say that the wolf looked suspicious, especially since it was wearing a hoodie, while critics say that the park is only investigating because the wolf was white. I had those crazy eyes. <laughs> Students in Nairobi, Kenya, moved their desks into the middle of the street and blocked traffic on a made road in the city to protest their school being demolished. School children chanted, we want our school, we need to study in school, as they sat in their desks. It's unclear why the school was demolished, but Foreign Policy magazine reports that it was done without any prior warning to parents who had already paid their children's tuition for the year. The school is located on land owned by a church, but it's unclear if the church had any hand in the decision to tear down the school. The BBC noted that the demonstration ended peacefully. This contrasts with a similar rally by school children in 2015 when they protested against a playground being sold to a development. This demonstration ended with children being tear gassed by police dispersed the crowd. Won't these kids ever learn? Damn kids can't do anything with them except tear gas them, I guess. It looks as though the president is using Mike Pence as a carnival barker for his many tremendous hotels. Vice President Pence appeared at a summit held at the Mayflower Hotel where he addressed several prominent Christian groups, such as the Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, and Russian Orthodox churches. At the event, Pence said that, quote, the Christian faith is under siege and that, quote, throughout the world, no people of faith face greater hostility or hatred than the followers of Christ. Pence promoted his speech seven times on his personal Twitter account, earning him a head shake from the president, who urged him to use more exclamation points in his tweets. The day after the speech, conference attendees were bused to the Trump International Hotel's presidential ballroom, where they dined on filet mignon rather than Trump steaks. Revenues from the banquet were paid to Trump Old Post Office LLC, at least indirectly, which at least indirectly benefits tr Donald Trump's trust his financial trust, not the other kind, which is long gone. Summit organizers say they booked the dinner two months ago and that Pence agreed to speak several months later. 
They said they chose Trump's hotel because it had a higher capacity than the Mayflower Hotel, and because, as we all know, there are only two hotels in Washington, D.C. Event planners say that the cost of food ran about $105 per plate, not including audiovisual and room rental fees. A similar event at the Trump Hotel by the Kuwaiti government cost $40,000 to $60,000, according to the Associated Press. The organizers of the summit say it cost a total of $4 million. Norman Eisen, a former U.S. ambassador to the Czech Republic, said that Trump has a pattern of mixing special interests with the utilization of his properties. While Eisen maintains that it's all likely to be legal, he called it unsavory, which is an excellent word to describe the president as well as a rotting pile of durian fruit. <laughs> Next month, Trump will dispatch Pence to speak in Atlantic City to a group of abortion rights activists to coincide with the opening of a new Trump casino. Yeesh. <laughs> this has been 5 on 20 News with Mike Ludwig. And Luke Goodhart. And an Icelandic unicorn. <laughs> Next up, a brief word from this week's sponsor, Cultivate Tucson. After that, we were lucky enough to be joined in the studio last week by visual artist and Tucson native Nika Kaiser, who spoke with me about her upcoming installation at the Steinfeld Warehouse. Stay tuned and stay creative, Tucson. Cultivate, Tucson's Spring 2017 pop-up market takes place on Saturday, May 20th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at 832 South 6th Avenue. Ticketed early bird hours are from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. and can be purchased at CultivateTucson.com forward slash early bird hours. For one day, Cultivate will turn an unused space into a market, coffee shop, and community gathering space with 50 local designers, makers, and more. A portion of proceeds will support community share. More information is available at CultivateTucson.com. A community impact announcement from KXCI.